All right, so before we start, I just want to say one caveat. There were a lot of questions turned in. So unless you want to be here till tomorrow morning, we're not going to be able to get to all of them. So if you turned a question in and we don't answer it today, talk to your small group leader, talk to an elder, talk to someone else who was up front this weekend that might be able to help you with that answer. Don't think that we're ignoring you. Someone's got to go home at some point today. So do you mind if we start just by introducing yourselves and maybe what church you are at? It might be good. <laughs> For those who don't know. Okay. I'm Ann Angstead, and I'm at Gilbert Bible Church after being at Grace Bible Church for a long time. Yeah, many of you were very young. Now you're the age I was when we came. I am Sarah Demarest, and I go to Grace Bible Church. And I am Janet Hayes, and I go to Grace Bible Church as well. Thank you, ladies, for being here, for being willing. I know this is probably not your first choice to be sitting on the stage, but we, we appreciate it, right? So I'm so glad that you're here. Okay, so we are gonna, gonna go through these questions. Thank you guys for putting questions in. It would be really boring if we had none. So, okay. So the first time that a friend or family member approaches us to talk about a problem that she's facing, what are a couple key things we should do or say in that first conversation? <laughs> All right, I'll start. Um, I think the f first and most important thing is just listen and ask them, what are they looking for? Are you, well, <laughs> if they're coming to me and they just want me to listen, that probably is not going to happen. Um, <laughs> those of you that have talked with me ever know that I, I yeah. But it really is important to listen. And Proverbs talks about a fool is the one that answers before he listens. So you want to listen and, and then try and help. And um, yeah, so that's, that's my first is listen. And now my friends are going to add on to that. <laughs> well, what? She stole my answer. Um. <laughs> Um, a couple of, I'll just give you a couple of references that I think are really helpful for thinking about listening. Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. Mm -hmm. So just hold back and make sure you understand. And then the verse that Anne was talking about, Proverbs 18.13, He who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. Um, so don't just assume because the first intro is like, Oh, I know exactly what they're going through. You might not. So, listen, um, and pray. First Thessalonians 5.17 says pray without ceasing. So you're just asking the Lord to help you think biblically and how to give them the kind of encouragement the Lord wants them to have from his word. Um, and then give them hope from God's word. Assure them of the sufficiency of God's word. Um, and assure them of God that he is working for their good through whatever the trial is. And now I literally have nothing to say. <laughs> I, little, I have Proverbs 18, 13 down and Proverbs 18 too. So, um, I would, the only thing I would say um, beyond that is to just keep asking questions. Um, I know you hear something and it means something to you. If I said that, this is what I would mean. But it's just good to keep asking questions to make sure you really are understanding what the person, like what the, the actual issue is and not assume that you understand it and then give counsel that just is not actually hitting the mark. Yeah. And it occurs to me also, Proverbs 18, 17, the first one to come sounds right until the other one comes and questions him. And I know that's Anne Angstead rendition. You probably don't find it exactly like that in any Bible anywhere. But the, you want to, especially if they're coming with a situation with a friend or with their child or with their spouse, um, there's, boy, Tom and I have found that out many, many times. You know, it sounds really bad. And then you hear the other side of the story and you go, kind of makes sense. So remember, especially if it's just something with themselves that's different, but if it's dealing with a conflict, 
Um, it doesn't always mean that the person, first person that comes is right. That's a proverb. It's, it's usually. But there, we know there's always three sides to a story. He said, she said, and what God knows. That's the, I mean, he's the only one that knows. So there's somewhere is the truth, and we all put our own um, ideas and things on it. So, yeah. And just one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, because we all have nothing to say about this. Um, <laughs> well, just because we've talked about what not to do, I mean, we yeah. want to listen yeah. and, and all of that. But um, many times, if you've been at Grace Bible Church for any length of time, you've heard we need to be encouraging one another with the character of God. And I think one, uh, it's not exactly a caution, but one thing that's very helpful to keep in mind as we are sharing God's character, we love the sovereignty of God at Grace Bible Church. Um, and it's a biblical truth, and we will stand on that all day long, as we ought to. Um, but it's also really helpful to keep that, especially if somebody's really struggling, they're hurting, they're going through something that's really difficult and hard to believe God's goodness in the midst of, at the same time, being with his sovereignty, is have some truth, some verses from God's word that not only encourage with the sovereignty of God, but also the goodness of God and the compassion of God and the wisdom of God, so that we're giving an accurate picture of who God is and not just parking on one one quality. They're all true, and they are all who he is, and it's the whole person of God that will comfort us. That's great. Thanks, Guy. All right, so then what about this situation? If you have a friend that's an unbeliever, can you still use scripture when speaking with her about her problems? And then why? why? <laughs> I'll jump on this one first. I have something to say. <laughs> um, I don't know what chapter it is in Cheryl's book, but there's a little section where she talks about using God's word with unbelievers, and I love that. I don't even know if it was a full chapter, if it was just like a little snippet. Um, maybe you'll, uh, you kind of mentioned it, I think, last night. But I thought that was so helpful, because I'm actually a little bit hesitant to bring God's word in, when, unless it's just the gospel um, with an unbeliever, and I don't think I should be. I don't think we should be, um, because God's word teaches us truth. It teaches us who God is, what he expects of his crea uh, creation, and we actually can use that when we're talking to unbelievers, um, not that they can even obey that, um, but that is actually the standard, and to put that in front of them, these are the, you know, this is the way God wants you to live, and to put that in front of them is actually teaching them, and it might open up um, an avenue for the gospel and a bigger conversation about what they really need. So I was really encouraged to, to actually start using scripture and truths from scripture about that aren't just the gospel with unbelievers. <laughs> Ditto. <Well>, okay. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Okay. So when someone we care about is suffering, we, we may want to encourage and comfort them, but we may also be afraid that we might say something we shouldn't. And we might not even know what that is. So what should we avoid saying to the person who is suffering? Uh, Proverbs, I mean, just scripture. Let's, let scripture speak to it. Proverbs 25, 20 says, like one who takes off a garment on a cold day or like vinegar on soda as he who sings songs to a troubled heart. Um, and that kind of goes along with Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Um, so I think that that helps us just understand um, to take time to listen long enough to get a sense of what the need is. We can grieve alongside somebody before we ever try to speak into it. And it's just A-OK -okay to say, I don't know what to say. Um, I think sometimes we want to just turn and avoid, and especially if somebody's lost a loved one. It's like, okay, I'm going to be careful. I'm never going to say that person's name. And that's heartbreaking. It, there may be some people that would want that, but most, you know, if they've lost a loved one, they, 
they want you to tell them what you remember about that person. Um, so I, I, but I do think, and I think it goes back to what you said just a minute ago, you don't want to necessarily just jump on, well, God is sovereign, you know. Your loved one died, God is sovereign. No, 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 no. You want, you want to sit and listen. And there may be an appropriate, there will be an appropriate time to remind them of God's sovereignty, but God's goodness. And so um, I think a lot of times, Job's counselors did the best job when they were quiet for a week. So that's sometimes helpful. But they did sit with Job. They sat and they were there. And so um, I know one thing that um, I have been told, and I, I think it's, well, let me know if you need anything. When it's, And we're especially talking like in Alaska. Well, let me know if you need anything. And, and we mean that. OK. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but be specific, say. I'm, I'd like to bring you dinner. What am I doing wrong? I think you put it closer to your mouth. Oh, oh. Do? You should put it closer to your mouth. Oh. <laughs> I need to put it closer to my mouth. I don't like this. OK. <laughs> uh, you guys finish. <laughs> you know what I was thinking. Wow. It's just helpful to go to the one that knows our hearts and he knows how to comfort. Um, and then also, instead of just thinking about what not to say, this is probably more on the side of the one that's having a hard time or suffering, just to believe the best about the encouragement that's being given to you, uh, even if it's not necessarily what you wanted to hear or it's not necessarily super comforting, but that person is. They love you, and they want to encourage you, and um, it probably came from just a desire to comfort, and even if it didn't necessarily hit home, um, just to be gracious and accept the love that they're showing. And this maybe is going a little beyond the question, but I think just another aspect of speaking into um, people who are suffering is just, um, it's don't look at it as one and done. And most of the time somebody's suffering, you're going to have a lot of opportunity over time, um, whether it's just continuing, certainly to continue to pray, but to continue to reach out, whether it's spending time with them or sending verses and texts or just telling them that you're praying for them or something that encouraged you from the word. But a lot of times it's just not forgetting about people and their grief or their suffering. One last thing, it may be just asking their permission to share, you know, if you don't know them well, um, you may want to ask them, are you okay if I share some scripture that's been encouraging to me? Um, and they're probably going to say yes, but some people, especially if you're dealing with someone that maybe you're not sure if they're a believer, um, so you can ask them, is it okay if I, you know, there's a, a song that's been really meaningful to me that's, you know, rich theology. Can I send that to you? That's helpful. Thank you, guys. Um, so in the last session, um, Cheryl was talking about um, bearing one another's burdens. So this question kind of has to do with that. So confronting a friend about her sin is one of the hardest conversations anyone can have. Do you have any biblical advice on how to do that well? <laughs> um, okay, this isn't this is not biblical advice. This is Tom's advice. So, that's pretty high, but it's not biblical. But don't have a an hour long conversation in five minutes so in other words don't if you need to confront your friend on some sin 
don't do it in the restroom right before church starts. Not a good idea. So that's just, that's just advice. Um, but you know what? I think it's just pray and pray and pray and ask the Lord for wisdom. Be ready with scripture. Um, don't come with your own opinions. Make sure that what you're, ask a lot of questions too, because I'll share a quick story. I know of a pastor's wife. It wasn't any of our pastors here or at Gilbert, um, who was out for lunch with her brother. Somebody saw her with her brother out for lunch, didn't know it was her brother, assumed it was inappropriate, went to somebody else at the church, caused a big hassle, and it was her brother. Asked questions, and as she shared that story, she said, I don't really know why they didn't just come over and say hello to me, you know? So be ready, um, have scripture, know, make sure that what you're addressing is sin. Now, it may be a preference area that you see if they keep going down this path, they're going to land in sin, but be wise in how you approach it. Just as a resource for this, we had an equipping hour last September that was called something like Rebuilding and Rebuilding Peace. It was referenced in our small group discussion, and I think the date was September 25th. Is that right? Yes, September 25th by Scott Maxwell, Equipping Hour. Super helpful reference, just talking about the nuances of the just how essential it is to be humble. Um, 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6 says, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's verse 5. Um, so to go in humility, to go having examined yourself with the log in your own eye, Luke 6, 41 and 42. Um, go, like Cheryl said last night, Hebrews 4, 12. God's word is what's living and active and able to discern the heart. You want to make sure that people are understanding from God's word what it is that you're bringing to them, that it's not just a preference or an opinion. Or, um, you're not, yeah. Um, but that, that equipping hour lesson did a really, just was super helpful in terms of thinking about the disposition we want to be cultivating all the time so that we're ready for people to bring things to us because we are missing out if we have hearts that are hard and resistant and unteachable to people coming to us. And then also the flip side of it, of how to go to somebody with humility, understanding that God's design, is the, the omniscient, perfect, holy God of the universe designed that non-omniscient, sinful people are the ones that he has called to speak into one another's lives to help us grow in holiness. So just to have that expectation that we aren't going to do it perfectly and other people aren't going to do it perfectly for us and that is part of God's design to grow us in Christ's likeness and as a body. That was super helpful. So that's a good resource also. Um, I would also just say the question says if you need to have it, like if you need to confront um, and maybe to take a step back and see if there's a way that just with regular conversation, maybe correction can happen first. If um, if we're all walking humbly um, or striving to walk humbly with each other alongside each other, and you're just having an everyday conversation, something comes, up, you know, something is said that's maybe off. Um, there's a lie in there. Um, there's a, a disbelief about God or something. Just to just to have in the conversation a correction. Most hopefully, most people are going to be have a soft enough heart to take that, and and that's kind of where. It, it ends, not ends, but just that's all that needs to be done. But um, if this question is about a pattern of sin that's just ongoing and confrontation needs to take place, um, the word sin is key. We need to make sure it actually is, is a sin. And Matthew 18 lays that out so clearly for us. Um, if there is a sin, we need to go to that person individually first and, and seek um, their repentance on that specific. And obviously, 
as Sarah said, I don't need to repeat all that, but just going with a humble, gentle heart, um, like relations, like we just talked about in our discussion groups. So this next one. Just one more resource. Uh, Ken Sandy's The Peacemaker has, it's a whole book, but the back of the book has what to do when you need to restore, what to do if somebody comes to you. It's, it's definitely a worthwhile book to have on your shelf. So uh, this next question kind of is somewhat related. So, how do you suggest we respond to someone who needs to hear the truth spoken in love, but she doesn't want to hear it? What do we do? How do we handle that? Can I have Lynn Fucci come up here? <laughs> we actually just talked about this in our um, small group. It was really sweet. Um, this is just, I'll just kind of recap a little bit of what we said and what some of the other ladies were saying. Um, but it doesn't mean that just because someone doesn't want to hear doesn't mean you don't need to say what's true and what's loving to say. Um, but to be respectful, I love Lynn just said um, there is someone in her life she wants to be respectful to and she'll say, I just listen to what they say. I respectfully don't agree. Um, can I share with you what I believe or what I think? Um, and just ask to be able to, to share something and then someone else had said, I think it was Jill, maybe, can I just have five minutes to explain what I believe about this, what I think is God's truth that applies to what we're talking about? Um, I think we need to be faithful and go and speak the truth in love. And remember, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. I am not the fourth person of the Trinity, neither are you. Um, but we need to go. And what has God called us to do? He has called us to be faithful. And I think the encouragement from Scripture is to believe. James 5.19, my brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back. I, really, I wrote it down wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, James 5. Janet's going to read. It's James 5.19, because I know I'm reading it. Wait a minute. But if, if somebody has wandered from the truth and you bring them back, here's, there's a blessing, and here it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. There you go. You may be an instrument in saving somebody's soul from death by speaking the truth in love. Thank you, Janet, for, <laughs> yeah. Oh, never mind. It's a boy, <laughs> it's I, I'm struggling from old. I have it down here written, <laughs> not, yeah. Okay. And then another thing I've learned from Anne Angstead is to give room for a second response. Mm -hmm. You know, first conversation, you might catch somebody cold. I mean, there's just a hundred reasons why the first response might not be all we would hope for. But to encourage somebody, give them scripture, you know, can I just ask you to take this home, spend some time looking at it, praying about it, and then let's talk again. And to be humble enough, you know, I may not be understanding the situation completely, but I really, you know, our goal here is to help each other to walk in newness of life that Christ purchased at the cross, you know, to, to be willing to keep talking and keep walking, not to make it a one and done, like, well, <laughs> clearly they're just in rebellion, you know? We all sometimes just aren't where we would like to be and need some more time to be ready to hear it. I want to add a, a story. Um, I'll make it quick. My father-in-law, um, Smed's dad, is, was a very... Um, I don't know, gregarious, very, he would just say, say what was right, or, or just say what he thought. So maybe before he was saved, he would just say what he thought. After he was saved, he would just say what he thought. But, and it was right, usually. Um, in their family, um, he had a brother who was not walking with the Lord, very uh, just rough lifestyle. And he was, he was sharing the gospel with him after, after his 
my father-in-law's name is Charlie, we'll make this easier. After Charlie was saved, he would share the gospel with his brother often, and it was not received well. And um, sibling, other siblings, parents would say, okay, you just need to back down. You don't have to always talk about the gospel with him. You don't, let's just, you know, it's just too hard, this family conflict that happens when we're all together if you keep talking about the gospel. Well, it, years go by. I think that, I don't know if I'm getting the whole story right. I think there were a few years maybe of even estrangement where there wasn't even conversations, um, really much of a relationship. Um, the brother hit rock bottom physically, spiritually, everything, and the first person he called was his brother, who had been speaking the truth to him. He said, I know you'll tell me what I need to hear. I, I want to talk about the gospel with you now. And Charlie flew out, I don't remember where he lived at the time, flew out and they had um, an intense 48 hours and he repented and trusted the Lord. But Charlie didn't give up and didn't stop talking and speaking the truth when everyone was like, just for the sake of some family peace, can we not talk about this all the time? Um, but his brother knew who to call when he needed to hear the truth. Thank you. Um, just so you guys know, we that's why we had the questions written down and put in the box, because they got to have a little powwow to kind of, that's why it, there's notes. We got to have a little powwow and look at the questions ahead of time. Um, so the next one, um, what are a few of your go-to passages of scripture that God has used significantly in your own life that you personally share with others in need? Um. Psalm 13, it's one of my favorites. Um, it's David, basically, it, okay, Anne Anks did, my Bible's not open. This is not a word for word at all translation. But it's like, God, where are you? Do you care about me? I'm, I'm in the pit. Help. And he, he goes through all these questions. So read Psalm 13, okay? But the, the bottom line is, and in my Bible, you actually, I turn the page, but God is faithful. And, you know, sometimes when I'm struggling, when we're struggling, all I can remember is, God, where are you? But you are faithful. I maybe don't have all the words if my Bible's not right there, but I know I can cry out from the depths of my heart and say, God, do you care about me? Oh, but God, you are faithful. And sometimes, especially when things are, I always picture it like the water's up to here and I'm drowning, and I, I can only do the bite size. God is faithful. God is good. It's those simple truths that are foundational. Um, that's just, okay, so the other ones, uh, Matthew 6, and we talked about that, I think all of the small groups did. Um, the birds of the air, I love that. Um, and Ro Romans 8, um, I know there's probably several that would raise their hands that have been told, just go read Romans 8 the whole chapter. Just read it. That will comfort your soul. John 14. Um, John 15. James 4. That is not so much comfort, but when there's fights and quarrels, why are they happening? Why, why am I having this fight or quarrel? Well, James 4 answers that question. Um, and then another one that probably more than one of you has been asked to read, uh, 1 Peter 3, and then go read chapter 4. And 1 Peter 3 is where Christ, um, oh. <laughs> I should have written it all down. Um, 1 Peter 3 is where we see Jesus. And when they are casting, um, they're hurling insults at him. And, okay, Sarah, can you help me with this? No. <laughs> Well, no, it's not that. I thought you could just quote it for me. That's what I, I was not meaning, meaning, meaning this help. But wait a minute. Oh, it's actually, I lied. I wrote it down wrong. It's First Peter 2, start in um, 
verse 19. The lights are kind of bright. That's, what, that's my problem. Um, <laughs> let's see. For it's commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and, and endure it? There's the question. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. I'm blowing through this, okay? Instead, this is Jesus. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And most of you, if you're a wife, you know what comes next. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. So if a woman is struggling in her marriage, that's, that's, it's encouraging to know that Jesus, by his wounds, we are healed. So those are, that's like a few. And there's like, just open your Bible. Everywhere, anywhere, you will be comforted. Yeah. One verse that has just been a go-to for me for a long time, and I've probably shared with many of you, um, the whole psalm, I mean, really any of these, you want to read the whole chapter, but Psalm 73, and especially mm -hmm. verse 28, um, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I've made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Um, that's been especially helpful for me personally, because a lot of times when I'm struggling, it's because I want something else besides God's nearness. I want someone's attention, or I want my way, or I just want circumstances to change. And to just preach these truths to myself, but wait, the Lord's nearness, he is near, and that's my good. I have him, I have everything I need. Um, and it just helps me to, to lay aside the idols. Um, Romans 8, Lamentations 3, a lot of these we've already covered. Um, so I think Cheryl mentioned last night, Psalm 103, Psalm 34, uh, Job 42, 2, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Um, and then one that is also I really love, and was someone just recently encouraged me with this. Again, I love that. We encourage one another, or give this to somebody else, and it comes back around because it's all true and it's living and active. It's, um, it never fades away. But 1 Peter 1, 6 um, says, In this you greatly rejoice, just having described the gospel, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. And I've always focused more on if the necessary, if it's necessary, I have trials. If I'm in a trial in God's economy, it's necessary. It's necessary for my sanctification. And that's not untrue. But they pointed out that the word distressed, I think um, there's another translation that uses sor made sorrowful, I think. Um, and I was sorrowful. And she said, even the sorrow is necessary. This is God's tool for you, for your good. Um, for his glory, to conform you to the image of Christ, um, to help you die to yourself. So that was, that's like my latest favorite go-to verse. Yeah. Um, I love this question. I have Psalm 1830. I love Psalm. Sarah's like, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, that verse says, this God, his way is perfect. The, way, the word of the Lord proves true. He is a refuge, no, a shield to those who take refuge in him. And that has meant so much to me for, for so many various situations, but it first came to my attention at a Friday night, a women's Friday night, and Chris was speaking, and she talked about how the way, God's way, is the manner in which he, I can't see you guys, the manner in which he deals with us, and I just was so sad about not having more babies at that moment in time, and um, but just so encouraged to know that that was God's manner of dealing with me, and it was perfect. Um, and I've gone back to that many times. And I've received that from other people since then, too, like you, Sarah, that's been sweet. Um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Um, I rehearse that often to myself. 
fall asleep thinking about that often. Um, John 6, 37. That might be a weird one, but I use this often with myself and with my kids as we talked about um, just being assured of salvation. How do we know that God has saved us and chosen us and just being reassured that whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. That's a huge encouragement to me. Uh, Romans 8, 28, of course. But as I said, the whole chapter is good. Um, 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. That's the one that talks about casting our cares on God because he cares for us. But verse 6 says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you at the proper time. And I think it's when I'm anxious about something, worried about something, and know I need to cast my care on God, I think it helps me so much to know I need to humble myself first under his hand. He's mighty. He's He's in charge of whatever's going on. I need to humble myself. Um, Philippians 4, 4 to 9. I'm sure that's the go-to for most of you, lots of us. Uh, what to think on, what to not be anxious about, what to do when we're anxious. And then Lamentations 3, 37. Um, see if I can remember it. It's whatever's, nobody can, basically nobody can say or do anything if God has not commanded it. And I think that's so helpful when there's decisions that are made that are out of your hands, made by whatever, authority or what seems like random chance. We know it's not. Um, those decisions were made by God and I trust him. Thank you. That's really helpful. All right. So we've talked a lot about speaking truth. So... Um, but to be gracious towards those who are struggling spiritually, we also need to listen well. We talked about that a little bit at the beginning. But how do we become better listeners? <laughs> I think we need to just listen and, keep, and oh, listen and keep your mouth shut. That's hard for me. Um, but it's really being quiet and being thoughtful and I think asking questions to make sure, like Janet said earlier, you know, okay, I'll give an example that Tom would give. You know, somebody says, well, we had a big fight. What does that mean? For some people, that means, you know, that the husband is reading the paper. Well, nobody reads a paper anymore. But back in the old days, when you read a paper, and then the husband's like, that's a big fight for some people. Tom and I have actually talked to people that there were guns and alcohol involved. So you need to define terms. Make sure you know, because there are some cultural things, sometimes just different family dynamics that when somebody explains something, you may not know, so ask good questions. Um, and I, oftentimes, it's just re, repeating back what they've said. Okay, so let me make sure I understood what you just said. Did you say this? Am I understanding you correctly? Um, sometimes it may be saying, well, can you give me an example of what you're talking about? Um, but listening really just sometimes. So. Yeah. And I too struggle with this. Pray, just pray and recognize that the fruit of the Spirit includes self control. And so I need to be prayerfully preparing myself to not walk in my flesh, but to walk in the Spirit, to be. I'm just controlling myself and controlling, you know, this thing that's on my mind that I want to say. I can, by God's grace, can choose to focus on what they're saying and not what I think I want to say next. Um, I found myself interrupting people, even with questions. I think I'm, oh, I want to draw them out and I want to ask more questions, but then I'm interrupting their, their answer or whatever they're saying. So um, just actually not talking. <laughs> And, and listening, just being slow to speak. Mm -hmm. I was giving good advice at one point, and I try to remember this, but I'm not always good with it. If someone else is talking and I'm thinking about what I'm gonna say next, I'm not actually listening. Mm -hmm. So I have to stop myself, self-control, stop myself from doing that and just actually listen. Sorry. 
one other thing that can be helpful, I would ask first, um, because I've had people misunderstand the intention, but ask if it's okay to take notes about what they're saying because you wanna make sure that you're getting, that you're listening well and understanding what they're saying. Um, and if they agree to that, that can be helpful because I have to really focus on what I'm hearing. Great idea. All right, what are some few practical steps we can take to begin speaking truth with grace to others? Well, we already had a plug for Wellspring, but I would say cultivate your own walk with the Lord, spend time in the word in a way that is humble and close and responsive so that you yourself are speaking truth to yourself, you're responding to God's word, you're praying, um, so you actually have something to say. <laughs> a lot of times, I feel like 99% of the time, something that God ends up using to encourage something else is just something that you know the Lord dealt with my own heart and my time with the word. Um, and then I think if you're just feeling like, man, but I never do that. I never actually just talk about God's word. It feels awkward for me to step in and say, can we pray? Or can I tell you a verse? Um, some kind of baby steps to practice for that would be preparing for your time in small group. Maybe if your small group does core questions or if you're in Wellspring and you're in a discussion group, that's a really easy way to prepare because there's homework and you can write it out ahead of time. But then especially if you really struggle with speaking truth, um, you know, pray about what your answers are and maybe put a star next to something like, you know, that is something that's been super helpful to me. And I imagine it might be helpful to someone else too. I'm going to really pray about being humble and, and relying on God's grace to, to share that truth in that setting. So just, you know, wherever you're at, whatever's hard for you, take the opportunities God has for you and prepare yourself with the word and with prayer to open your mouth and speak truth with love. One other maybe, I don't know if it's a baby step, but just an important thing is um, sharing what you're learning in God's word with your husband or your roommate or your children um, and asking them. Uh, that's just a good way to start articulating what God has been teaching you. And I, I don't feel like I'm very good at that. And so I love to be in God's word and I love to read it and think about it. But then to talk about it, I think is, I don't know, it just seems harder. So it's good. Those are really comfortable and sweet relationships. Those you know, household relationships, um, it's a good place to start being able to articulate what God is teaching you and what you're shepherding your own heart with, and vice versa. Thank you. All right, so this um, has to do with the First Thessalonians 5 passage that we read. What are some helpful questions or practical ways to assess if a sister needs admonishment, encouragement, or help? Um, one of the first things is determining are they unruly? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be slow to get there, unless I mean if if somebody comes to me and they confess that they're committing adultery. Okay, I picked something, or they're stealing money f at work. Um, clear sin. I, I don't even have to think about it. I, I know without opening my Bible, because I know that violates God's law, um, and they don't want to stop, and they're being really icky about it. Okay, they're unruly, um, but I'm not going to get there in most cases. Let's say somebody is just has a habit maybe of complaining about their kiddos. I'm not going to necessarily assume that she's being unruly. I'm probably going to think she's either weak because she's exhausted because she's up every night, every two hours because her baby's not sleeping, or she's faint-hearted because of those things or whatever the circumstance may be. So I'm going to be very, very careful to get there. I don't know if that answered did that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, so we, as we were discussing this beforehand, we were thinking about the example. Um, typic, you know, let's say you, um, maybe you have kids who are in school and it's, there's things about the situation that are just really hard or maybe it's a, a work situation and the circumstances are just very trying and it's ongoing. There's not necessarily any end in sight where it's going to get easier. Um, you, I mean, as we've been talking, you want to listen enough, um, but be, and as you listen and as you're asking questions, you're you're thinking through, you know, is this person, does it look like they're in danger of being swept into, like that they're weak, like maybe they they're not in sin right now, but they're being tempted to um, be really discontent with their situation or to join the crowd and, and be influenced into sin by their situation, that's probably a weak person. They're not there yet, but, but there's some wavering. They're not really well established against a sinful response to their circumstances. Um, so those you might be thinking along the lines of just, is, are you hearing those kinds of things as they talk about the situation? Um, are they, are they, as you, they talk about it, they're describing something that, that's hard. Um, maybe they don't even know how to persevere. Uh, and and they're, they're weary, uh, they're faint-hearted, but, but there's not necessarily a pattern of sin or even necessarily what you would see is that they're on the cusp of danger of sin. Well, that, that's just faint-heartedness. That person needs encouragement. They need to be fortified with the truth of God's word and with your love and your support and your prayers. Um, and then the sin is, you know, where you, especially if you're seeing um, a pattern of sin, you know, this person, every time they have a hard day at work, they come home and get drunk. You know, well, that's a pattern of sinful responses that you would want to Start with instructing from scripture, right? This is what scripture says about that. Can I help you? You know, let's talk about what's going on at a heart level, why you would turn to that. And if there's just a ongoing pattern of sin resistant to God's word, um, then you're really just in Matthew 18 at that point, I guess. And I, I think, I'm not sure if we mentioned this already, or maybe Cheryl did in her teaching. The biggest thing with all three categories what are we, what am I as the instrument God may be using, hopefully, Lord willing? I'm to be patient. And boy, especially if you're dealing with somebody that's being unruly, being patient with them can be hard. But you know what? Just because they're being unruly, God did not give me a get out of jail free card and say, I can be really nasty and impatient and let them have it don't get that we're to be patient with everyone great all right so how can we confess our sins well and wisely okay, i'll start it you guys finish it um so when we got this question we were discussing Okay, well, sometimes there's confession that needs to be made where there's been sin against a specific person. So obviously you need to go to that person that you've sinned against, confess, and seek reconciliation. Or maybe this is in general. How do I confess sin? More like maybe we're thinking of a small group setting. Um, and so we, we had a few different um, thoughts on that. But um, confession um, of sin is uh, not something that... It's not something that we do just to feel better or to say, okay, well, I confess that, and so now I cannot feel bad that I've been doing that. Um, it, it really is, the purpose of it is to seek to turn from it, right? So with confessions, that step in repentance. Um, so we were talking about if there's something that's been done and it's not, oh, I don't know how to say this, except, except for, I don't know if any of you had people confess something to you where you actually didn't know they sinned against you, <laughs> but it was something more just between them and God, but um, they've come to you and confessed it and asked for your forgiveness. That's just, it's, it's a little hard and awkward because you didn't even know that they had sinned against you in that way. So that's, that type of thing needs to be confessed to the Lord. 
um, it doesn't necessarily, if it's, uh, what was it, Anne, if it's between your ears? Between your, yeah. If it's <laughs> just in my brain, like if I'm thinking, well, I'm just bitter against you, I, I just feel bitter and angry at you, but I'm not expressing it, um, or maybe jealousy might be a good one, not a good one. Yeah. <laughs> But a, a good example, that's what I mean, where, where I'm just, I, or I'm coveting something you have, um, but I, I never, you know, I don't try and steal it, I don't, you know, I, I, the sin doesn't come out except between my ears. Yeah, confess that to the Lord. Right, and that's First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I know I blew that. No, I, 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 I think I twisted a couple words. Check, check me on it. I don't know. <laughs> then if, it's a, if that sin that is, you know, it's really a heart situation, a heart sin, but you're really recognizing that you're just kind of repeating it over and over and you need help with that, then that's the time to find someone that can walk with you through that to help you get out of the trap. Um, um, so, and we had some other ideas. Some other thoughts on that. Right? That was a while no. ago. Okay. <laughs> that was an hour ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we only have time for one more. Um, because time is flying. So this is going to be the last one. Again, if we didn't get to yours, I'm so sorry. You can ask somebody else. How do we wisely speak on matters such as the supernatural? So to not deny that not everything is just a result of laws of nature while not affirming any myths or unhelpful speculations. Sorry, I have this one too. Um, so my first thought was um, Ephesians. Well, I don't know if it was my first thought, but my first thought actually was Deuteronomy 29, 29, but we'll go there after I look at Ephesians. Oh, here it is. Oh, I put a bookmark. Wow. <laughs> um, Ephesians 6. Um, this is where it talks about the armor of God. Um, in verse 12, it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in, in the heavenly places. And so we obviously know that supernatural is real. Um, God is spirit himself. There is Satan is real. Demons, angels are real. Um, and we know here our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to put on the armor of God. And that is um, the helmet of salvation. It's truth. It's, um, what else is there? The gospel, um, knowing God's word, trusting him, um, submitting to him, obeying him. Those are our tools of spiritual battle. Um, so as much as we know the supernatural is real, we aren't told a whole lot about the supernatural. Um, we see demons in the Gospels, and we know that those things are, are real and true. However, that's where Deuteronomy 29, 29 comes in. Um, this verse says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. So the things that God wants us to know about the supernatural is here. We have enough. Um, and we're told how to live. And we're told what to believe, what to think, what to put on. And that's pretty much it. And the things that we don't know, that's not for us to know. The things that aren't revealed in Scripture, that's not for us to know. That's, that's God's. And we can entrust those questions and those uncertainties to him. You know, he's, he's more powerful than all of it. And we belong to him. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for being here.